Well, hi everyone. There certainly has been a lot of exciting space-related news here recently, in particular, in this, in this week, as a matter of fact. I've long held an interest in all things related to space and space exploration. Like uh, many of you out there, you're close or if not a little bit older than me as far as age group. And uh, I'm 60 years old, but I can remember as a kid being just utterly enthused with the Apollo missions in particular. Uh, I became, uh, see, I was about six years old when Apollo 11 astronauts uh, landed on the moon and watched it live on a recently acquired color television that my dad bought. And uh, my dad also had a set of National Geographic's. Pretty much everything in the 60s had one or more articles related to the space program. So as a kid, I'd go back and read all those past issues and really got up to speed in what was going on. Now we're in a situation, what I would call Space 2.0, where private sector companies are taking on lead roles, not only for commercial enterprises, but also to support NASA's missions. So for example, we just had the launch of the Boeing Starliner, the first successful launch with crew. And as I'm recording this, they had just docked with the International Space Station. And of course, uh, SpaceX Starship had another test launch this morning. This ship's absolutely massive. So in this video, I want to talk about what the overall program is to get humans back on the moon. This is a U.S.-led effort, but there'll be astronauts from other countries, uh, in, for example, from Japan, that will be sending people to the surface of the moon. Also, I'm going to cover the geotechnical aspects that have been related to not only past Apollo missions, but upcoming Artemis missions. Artemis is the program name for returning astronauts to the surface of the moon. So what is the Artemis program? It's a series of ongoing lunar missions that are run by NASA. The first phase of Artemis, the Artemis 1 mission, was completed in November 2022 which involved an uncrewed test flight, which orbited the moon and returned. The next missions will be Artemis II, which will be a crewed flight that'll go well beyond the moon and orbit and return to Earth. Artemis III will be the first crewed moon landing since December 1972. Artemis IV will deliver key pieces of the Lunar Space Station, which is named Gateway into orbit around the moon and place two astronauts on the moon's surface. Artemis V will add another important module to Gateway and it will involve a third crewed lunar landing to undertake more research. For those of you who are familiar with your Greek mythology, Artemis is the twin sister of Apollo. So it's an aptly named program for returning people to the moon. Here's a little bit of video showing the Artemis I launch. So the Artemis I mission utilized the Orion crew capsule, and the Space Launch System, SLS rocket, which is more powerful than the Saturn V rocket used during the Apollo missions. So this shows you some of the details associated with each of these upcoming Artemis missions. Artemis II, which will take astronauts around the moon, is scheduled to be launched late in 2025. It originally was scheduled for September of this year, but as I mentioned, it's been pushed back. As I mentioned, Artemis is gonna involve placing humans back on the moon, but a key aspect of the Artemis program is that they're going to pre-deploy a lot of equipment and material so that it's they're waiting for the astronauts. And one of the really cool things as far as the Artemis program is a new rover. In this case, they call it the Lunar Terrain Vehicle. The rover that you remember from the Apollo missions, Apollos 15, 16, and 17, was called the Lunar Roving Vehicle, LRV. A lot of people nicknamed it the Moon Buggy. But there'll be a new terrain vehicle, lunar terrain vehicle developed as part of Artemis. And they'll no doubt start with what was already done for the Lunar Rover. I mean, it was an amazing program. There was an initial round of early design among multiple teams, NASA selected their preferred team and negotiated a contract that turned out to be Boeing as the lead contractor and then General Motors, who had done work since the early 60s 
on potential vehicles to traverse the lunar surface. The lunar rover was a two-person vehicle, 10 foot long, 44 inches high, with a seven and a half foot wheelbase. It had a total payload of 1,080 pounds. The wheels and tires were really unique. The tires were made using woven steel wires that were zinc coated, and then they attached riveted titanium strips for treads. But these lunar rovers greatly extended the astronauts' range during Apollo missions 15, 16, and 17. In fact, Apollo 15, they traversed a total of 17.25 miles in the lunar rover. Apollo 16 was 16.5 miles, and all kinds of records were set with the Apollo 17 mission with uh, 22.3 miles. They also have the unofficial lunar vehicle speed record at 11.2 miles per hour, so I think uh, Gene Cernan got after it on that one. And uh, really interestingly, they got as far as 4.7 miles away from the lunar module, which is quite scary because if something had gone wrong with the lunar rover, the idea was that they'd have to hike back to the limb and uh, if anything happened to their air supply and temperature control, they'd be in real trouble. So NASA wanted them to stay within a certain radius so that theoretically they could walk back to the limb if necessary. So as I mentioned, the lunar terrain vehicle for Artemis is gonna be pre-deployed. So that's gonna go on a separate mission and be there waiting for the astronauts. Now for Apollos 15, 16, and 17, the LRV, the lunar roving vehicle, was stowed inside the lunar excursion module, uh, descent module. You can see some images here showing how the rover was deployed. The astronauts would pull a rope and there's a series of springs and the rover would unfold and slowly lower to the moon surface. This is how they folded it up to begin with. Quite an ingenious design. So this next video we'll see, I believe this is Apollo 15, where they're loading the lunar rover into the descent module. Here's an overview of the lunar missions that involved astronauts going to the surface of the moon. There's been a total of 12 astronauts to walk the surface of the moon. And this was for Apollo's 11, 12. Of course, Apollo 13 didn't make it to the moon. They had to orbit and return due to equipment failure. Then we had Apollo 14, 15, 16, and 17. Now, during the time that Apollo was really under development, the key phases of NASA's manned missions starting out in the 60s, NASA was led by its second administrator, James Webb. And Webb was a strong advocate for not merely space exploration, but performing a lot of science and, and learning. And he thought it was a, an important part of these missions. It wasn't just about beating the Russians to the moon. And you've no doubt heard of uh, the James Webb Deep Space Telescope. It was named after a former NASA administrator. Now for the new lunar terrain vehicle, NASA just announced that they've entered into contracts with three prime firms. You have Intuitive Machines, Lunar Outpost, and Astrolab. So they're gonna expect these companies to develop early concepts of a lunar terrain vehicle, and then NASA will have a selection process to go with the preferred design and team, and then negotiate a contract for full production. It's been estimated that uh, right now the total program cost or budget for the lunar terrain vehicle is gonna be about $4.6 billion. Next generation of lunar vehicles are gonna have a lot more capability, a lot more range. There's just gonna be more involved with them. And again, we're still talking about unpressurized crew vehicles, but they look pretty interesting to me. Different design concepts that are out there right now. This Astrolab, they've got this so-called flexible vehicle Obviously, this is an Earth-based prototype. But yeah, I mean, the, the idea is the same. You're going to have two astronauts that are going to be aboard this 
lunar terrain vehicle. And that was great about the Apollo missions that had the lunar roving vehicle. They collected lots and lots of soil and rock samples. And most of what we know about the moon, geologically speaking, came from those last three Apollo missions. So I mentioned I'm gonna talk about the geotechnical aspects of this. There was a lot of design work that had to go into figuring out what kind of tire would work on the lunar terrain. The Apollo era lunar rover was powered by two silver oxide 121 amp hour batteries. It was an all wheel drive vehicle. Each wheel hub had a motor with a rating of a quarter horsepower. Now I came across this presentation on Lunar Geotechnical Engineering Guide and it was put together by a, a John Connolly and he outlined some really great references for the engineering properties of lunar soil and rocks. So let's introduce a term here, regolith. You probably heard this term. It's a layer of unconsolidated rocky material covering bedrock. And of course, the regolith on the moon is very fine and powdery. And that's the result of millions and billions of years of micrometeorite impacts, that essentially just pulverize small particles into even smaller particles. So what we know from both manned and unmanned missions to the moon from an engineering standpoint has been compiled into this reference called the Lunar Source Book. And this reference was listed in that slide presentation for NASA that I just mentioned. The entire contents of this Lunar Source Book has been digitized. So I'll put a link in the description so that you can read some of these chapters for yourself. Chapter nine is the geotechnical engineering chapter. So as I mentioned, they used information that was compiled from both US and Soviet missions. In November, 1970, the Lunakud-1 unmanned rover was landed on the surface of the moon by the Soviets. It traveled around and put together these stitched or mosaic panoramas of the lunar surface and you could see the tracks that were left by the rover. This rover was placed on the western edge of Mare Imbrium. There was a later mission in 1973 and it landed east of where the first mission landed. So why do we care about geotechnical engineering properties of lunar soil? Well, to go back to the moon with humans, they're gonna have to build a base camp on the surface of the moon. They have to complete final design of their lunar terrain vehicle in terms of the, the tires and the wheels and how much power they're required to have. Uh, there's, a, there's a lot that goes into it. So during the Apollo era in preparing for the design and construction of the lunar roving vehicles, they had to estimate what the properties of the lunar soils would be. And by the time the lunar rover program came around, they already had samples from Apollo 11 and 12 of lunar soil and rock. So obviously there wasn't enough soil to actually use for tests of these tires and wheels for a prospective lunar roving vehicle. So they had to produce a simulated lunar soil. And this is what a gradation curve looks like. This is the distribution of grain sizes. And we're talking about sand size particles and smaller essentially sand to small clay particles uh, in terms of size. And this is a gradation from an Apollo 17 soil sample. So what I did is I plotted the Apollo 17 grain size distribution in blue here and next to the simulated lunar soil gradation. And it was quite close. Of course, the lunar soil was actually uh, quite a bit finer but overall, I think they did a pretty good job simulating the lunar soil for these lunar rover vehicle tests. In geotechnical engineering, we talk about soil shear strength. For lunar soils, shear strength factors into bearing capacity. How much load can you place on the surface or just below the surface uh, of the moon? It could be for the pads of the descent module of a lunar lander, or it could be to understand how much traction you can get with a manned roving vehicle. So this is what's called a Moore-Coulomb failure criterion. 
and it consists of a slope and if that sloping line has a y-intercept, that value for the y-intercept is called cohesion. So the shear strength of the soil is a function of the cohesion plus the confining stress times the tangent of the angle of internal friction. Now from this lunar source book, we see that the angle of internal friction for lunar soils is extremely high. So for sandy or even gravelly soils here on Earth, typical angles of internal friction are, say, from the mid-30s to the low 40 degree level. So here we see angles of internal friction of up to 55 degrees and all above the low 40 range. So very significant amount of friction available between these lunar soil particles. And it turns out that these lunar soil particles are quite angular. Now we know if you pile a loose granular material up, say from a conveyor, if it's a stockpile at a quarry or something like that, the pile will reach equilibrium such that it can't get any steeper. The surface of that sloping pile of material can't get any steeper. And that's called the angle of repose. And it's related to the available shear strength or the angle of internal friction of these particles. So for the moon, you have the potential for some very steep, loose piles of material. And I know during the Apollo missions, they were extremely careful about avoiding getting into a crater that was too steep and consist of very loose powdery material that they couldn't climb out of. So that was something they really had to be careful for. And then talking about bearing capacity, this shows a pad, a foot pad of the lunar lander, the descent module. Now the allowable bearing pressures on the surface of the moon are, are quite large. To give you an idea here, if we look at around eight kilopascals, which is about 167 pounds per square foot, that pretty well covers the pressure for the lunar module foot pad, as well as the lunar roving vehicle contact uh, pressure with the wire wheel, as well as uh, an astronaut standing on one boot. But we can see here that the ultimate bearing capacity is many times higher than what we would expect here on Earth. So for typical soils, let's say you have a, a building with a shallow foundation Let's say it's a, it's a Wendy's, just to throw an example out there. Typically, those footings are going to be designed for a contact bearing pressure of anywhere from 2,000 pounds per square foot to 4,000 pounds per square foot, which is 100 to 200 kPa. But you can see here, you can go well above 1,000 kPa or 20,000 pounds per square foot for allowable bearing pressure for a footing on the moon. Another reason why you wanna know the properties of the lunar soils is to understand how difficult it will be to excavate. Here's a slide from that NASA presentation. It indicates the upper 10 to 15 centimeters or four to six inches of the regolith will be relatively easy to excavate. And then as you go deeper, it gets harder and harder. I think the uh, astronauts on Apollo 15, 16, and 17 were only able to get their dry samples into the surface of the moon a couple of feet. There was a lot of resistance to driving those steel tubes into the lunar surface. Now, NASA did a lot of testing of the prospective lunar wheels. And here's some examples of what they did. They had a test bed of the simulated lunar soil. They used different amounts of uh, compaction to achieve different densities of the soil. A lot of this work was done at Waterways Experiment Station. It's the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers lab in Vicksburg, Mississippi. There's a lot of smart people down there. I had an assignment there in the early 90s when I worked for the Corps of Engineers doing a bunch of slope stability analysis for a dam project. But it's, it's a very interesting place. So in their study, they looked at six versions of the Boeing GM wire mesh wheel. And they, as I mentioned, estimated the properties of the lunar soil by the samples that were collected from Apollo 11 and 12 missions. One of the key aspects of the lunar rover is that the astronauts had to train in learning how to drive the thing. So this was an early prototype. They did a lot of training out in the desert 
northeast of Flagstaff, Arizona, at the Cinder Lake Crater Field, they, they created the crater field with high explosives. So let's look at this Google image. You can still see these craters today in many cases. It's the, the round shape. Now there's a really good book about the details associated with the design and production of the lunar roving vehicles. And that's this book, Across the Airless Wilds by Earl Swift. So that's a very interesting book if you want that kind of level of detail. One of the things they did to test the prototypes of the lunar rover is they had to simulate the lower gravity, the one-sixth gravity that's on the moon compared to the Earth. So they would take these KC-135 jets, commonly referred to as the Vomit Comet, and fly these steep parabolic arcs to create a few seconds of uh, low G environment. Through this testing, they discovered they had a hard time getting in and out of the rover, and they later added some tow holds, which solved the problem. Here's some images here of Apollo 15 cruising around. They had a navigational computer so that they could find their way back to the lunar excursion module in the most direct route possible. So that'd be a little quicker than necessarily following their tracks back to the limb. But this is just exciting stuff to me. I remember as a kid, when there was a particular Apollo mission, when people were on the moon, I'd go out at night looking at the moon and just imagining that there's actually people there walking around on the surface. And I had this uh, low powered telescope and you have to bear with me because I was only like seven years old, but I was trying to find the uh, astronauts and their lander using my telescope. And obviously I couldn't do that, but uh, I gave it a go anyway. So that's something I want to say about these manned missions to the moon and beyond. It's incredibly exciting. And if you're under the age of, say, 52, 54, somewhere in there, you will have no direct memory of what it's like to know that there's people walking around on the moon. It's just tremendously exciting. And I think without a doubt, that's what got me interested in science and engineering was the whole space program. And I think the new version of the space program is going to be even more exciting with a lot more things being done. It's a quite ambitious program and it's going to bring in a lot of people, a lot of engineers, a lot of companies, particularly private sector companies. So it's, it's wide open and it's extremely exciting. Now, one of the things I would like to see is a lunar motorcycle. The development of the lunar rover was initially quite behind schedule and over budget. So NASA was starting to get nervous about the viability of being able to deploy a lunar rover with the last three Apollo missions. So they started working on a potential lunar motorcycle concept. And again, this is being done in the KC-135 plane. Obviously this is a Honda 90 it would be not used on the moon whatsoever because of the rubber tires and internal combustion engine, but clearly they're testing here just to see if the astronaut has sufficient balance and dexterity to actually operate a motorcycle. And here you can see the suspension hooks to reduce the weight on the astronaut to simulate a lower G environment. Here's a new concept called the tardigrade for a lunar motorcycle. Again, I don't think that anyone's actually developing one of these, but I think it would be really cool. Initially, NASA hadn't planned to develop the lunar roving vehicle. Their initial concept was to have a pressurized lunar lab that could move around on the surface of the moon. And those mobile labs were gonna be deployed in their own Saturn V rocket missions, unmanned, just to get them to the surface of the moon and be there waiting for the astronauts that would come in a separate Apollo mission but those extra Apollo Saturn V rockets were canceled pretty early on. So NASA came back later to a much smaller vehicle that could be stowed on the descent module of the limb. But interestingly, as part of Artemis, Japanese are developing a pressurized mobile lab. And here's a concept from Toyota. So again, these are exciting times. I appreciate you letting me move into a different area of uh, geotechnical engineering, but I had to des describe the overall program for going back to the moon and beyond with human missions. I wanna send a shout out to the channel members. I really appreciate your ongoing support. 
I also want to thank those of you who have provided super thanks. That's another great way to support the channel. I'm going to have a new digital download. Right now I have the top 100 civil engineering disasters, but I've got some new ones that I'll add a link to in the description for future videos, possibly even this one after a few days. So thanks for watching, everyone.